We're absolutely delighted to be joined by the Ambassador of Israel, uh, Mr. David Avery. Uh, I don't have to tell anyone in this room uh, the importance of the Middle East, nor do I have to underline your deep interest in the topic, nor do I have to remind anyone of the long and torturous process toward tranquility in that troubled part of the world, nor do I have to remind you of the uh, uniqueness of this present moment uh, as a part of that long and uh, very difficult process. The ambassador has agreed to brief us on the current situation in the Middle East, for which we're deeply indebted. I only should say a couple of things, I think, with respect to the ambassador's career, merely to briefly introduce him to you, uh, the subject matter uh, you're prepared for. The ambassador uh, had a, has had a long and very rich career of public service. He was an Air Force officer, as you know. He first flew combat missions in 1956 uh, in the Sinai campaign and he flew combat missions in two other campaigns or wars. He also was the commander of the Air Division during the Yom Kippur War. He later became the uh, head of the commander of the Israeli Air Force. Uh, during his five years as commander, uh, the, Israeli, the uh, Iraqi uh, nuclear power plant was destroyed and uh, Syrian surface-to-air missiles in the Baqa Valley were destroyed. That was the years 1977 to 1982. He served as the uh, Deputy Chief of Staff of the Israeli Defense Forces, and then he served for a decade as uh, the Director General of the Ministry of Defense, and then also served later as the uh, Deputy Assistant uh, Minister for Strategic Affairs before becoming then the National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister and Head of the National Security Council. And following that, of course, his present post as Ambassador of Israel to the United States. And during those later years of his career, he headed up numerous delegations uh, and uh, groups dealing with defense matters, regional security, military relations with the United States. It's been a sober time, the time of his, uh, his career, and one of deep experience for him. He's been at the middle of Israelis, uh, the life of Israel. Uh, we're absolutely delighted that he's agreed to be with us tonight. It's my enormous pleasure and honor to present to you Mr. David Avery, Ambassador of Israel to the United States. Well, good evening. Thank you very much for the warm introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to come here. I want to commend Frank Bird for the way he's running this organization. I was very much surprised to see a big audience like you have here, and thank you very much for the way you are doing it. Uh, I know people are very much interested in, in the question and answer part of the, of the evening. Some of them are waiting for a long, giving a long question, sometimes without the question marks. And, uh, it's not going to be easy because you have to listen to my speech first. <laughs> but there is a story about uh, a man who used to have a speechwriter. And uh, they were building up a confidence between both. So the speechwriter was just putting the papers on the podium. And the man came over there and gave a speech without any hesitation. So it happened once that he was asking for a speech for 15 minutes, and then uh, it came up that it was about 30 minutes. Coming back home, he was very much complaining. 
arguing a bit, so they went to see the papers and they found that there were, there were two copies. <laughs> I have used three copies. <laughs> so uh, I'll start. Ladies, gentlemen, and lawyers. <laughs> it is always Almost 20 years has passed since Abba even made, made what had been announced as one of his most famous remarks, saying that the Palestinians never fail to miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. His words are as relevant now as they were 20 years ago. It is almost now about more than 20 months that Prime Minister Barak came to power with a mandate from Israeli public to negotiate the final peace agreement with the Palestinians. Barak promised to leave no stone unturned in the quest for peace and was true to his word. He went to Camp David, prepared to make the difficult compromises necessary to bring the Palestinian Israeli conflict to an end. Barak offered the Palestinians the most far-reaching proposals ever offered by any Israeli leader. He broached the most difficult issues between Israelis and Palestinians, issues that had never been discussed in the seven years of the Oslo process. Final borders, Jerusalem, settlements and refugees. Instead of extending an olive branch of their own, the Palestinians responded with unprecedented violence, rioting, sniper attacks, lynching, and destructing of the holy sites. They sacrificed their own people, especially children, by closing down schools and sending students to participate in riots. Children should be at schools. They should be educated for peace and not for riots. In whole, the Palestinians carried out more than 10,000 violent attacks against our soldiers and civilians. In an effort to pressure Israel into further concessions while gaining international sympathy. As the riots began to wane, the Palestinians resorted almost ex exclusively to terrorism. Including, including a series of car and bus attacks against civilian targets in Jerusalem, Hadera, Tel Aviv, and Netanya. This bomb attack are the direct result of the release of 80 known terrorists, many of whom were responsible to the wave of suicide bombing in the mid-90s. Israel is had to impose a closure on the terrorists and territories in order to minimize the ability to infiltrate Israel proper. The closure was a def defensive act and not a policy of economic punishment. Furthermore, the Palestinian Authority knew full well the economic implication of the riots, but decided to initiate the violence anyway. Israel has a vested interest in economic development of the Palestinian area. Vast resources were invested in developing industrial parks at entry points to the Palestinian areas to create employment opportunities to Palestinian workers. Early on, the rioters, the rioters targeted the industrial parks that we had jointly established to implement, to inflame the situation. It goes without saying that the terrorism, the terrorism and destruction of property had eroded Israeli public support for the peace process. Even in the Israeli peace camp, many no longer believe that Arafat is a leader who genuinely strives for peace. This is a part, partially due to the fact that these demands go well beyond what Israel can possibly offer. Remember, this is the view 
even among those willing to make the most substantial concessions. The Palestinians have once again missed an opportunity. Maybe the biggest since rejecting the partition plan in 1947. As a result of the violence, Barak has been blamed for going too far. Now, the opportunity to reach a final agreement during Barak's terms has all but passed. Barak came to power believing that there was a unique window of opportunity that would remain, remain open for a brief period of time. He moved forward courageously. The Palestinian failed to move at all. Normally I'm comparing this kind of situation to a climb on the Himalaya mountain. The two thirds of the climb, the first one, are quite relatively easy. Not for me, but for young people. Over there you have still the Sherpas, you have still the logistics and the support which you have is all your coalitions and parties. Third part is the most difficult one. Over there, there's a coverage of snow, coverage of clouds, lack of oxygen. Sherpas are waiting down. Some people are looking up and see if he's going to make it, it's all right. They are looking away if he's going to come back. And Barak moved along a high way on this kind of third part of the climb. He did the extra mile, what you normally say. Looking backwards, he didn't find Arafat with him. Arafat was staying in the two third, coming back from Camp David like a hero because he didn't make any concession. He stayed with the Sherpas, with his people, without making any concession, making the brave or the courageous steps which any leader should do. That's why in some way Barak is now in this kind of political situation. The third part of the peace process is the most difficult one. Facing the Jerusalem issue, the right of return, those are the issues which are really the essence of the conflict. When we were speaking the first two thirds, to give up Gaza Strip, it was very easy. We wanted to give it up much, much more than they wanted to get it. Then it was a bit more difficult to go to the other cities and coming to Hebron. But now we are facing the real most difficult one issues which normally are such that maybe there is no really a good solution for it because it's the fundamental issues for each side of the partners. And here I normally say that Arafat got the frequent flyer ticket without doing the mileage. He's been received many times in the White House much more than almost any leader, because he gave the impression that he won peace, but he didn't make any mileage on the peace, not too much inches on the third part of the climb. Although it seemed that during the last few weeks, instructions were given to reduce the level of violence, hostilities, after four months, we have yet to hear Arafat give a clear and public order to stop the violence. In fact, he has taken to arming himself with a gun, a symbolic call, to continue the uprising. And we can see, once he's coming to a meetings, he's still wearing uniform. Is it not a symbol? Our people are coming normally civilians. Some of them have been very high-ranking officers, generals, commanders. They are coming, all of them, civilians. We are looking for peace. We are not looking for uniform. Now, with President Bush in office, an election in Israel only three weeks ahead, we are trying to ensure that the window of opportunity remains open. It seems that Arafat has finally come to the conclusion that he is indeed missing his great opportunity. For this reason, he has decided to quicken the pace of the talks now taking place in Taba, Egypt. Unluckily today, there were two people who been killed in Tulkaran near the border uh, within the Palestinian Authority control, two Israeli one which came over there to make business and just have been assassinated sitting in a restaurant. So Prime Minister Barak has to call back the mission to stop the talks. This is the Middle East. 
you cannot focus even what's going to be two hours from now. Speaking about Israeli elections, I'm reminded of an old story about conversation being taken between late President Eisenhower and late Prime Minister Ben-Gurion. Eisenhower said, do you know how hard it is to be a president of 150 million people? Ben-Gurion replied immediately, it is much harder to be a prime minister of two million prime ministers. <laughs> Whoever is going to, to be elected in Israel, and we have to remember that we are a democratic society, and it's legitimate to have a leader, anyone which the public is going to be elected. One thing it's going to be certain, even after the elections, we will still have six million prime ministers, and each one of them knows better how to run the country. Meanwhile, the current Israeli government is committed to continuing the negotiations. Our focus is remain on efforts to reduce Palestinian violence. In recent days, there have been several meetings between the two sides on the issue of security. However, these meetings have only taken place at the highest military levels. We have not seen coordination between officers on the field level or working level, and the Palestinians have not renewed the security cooperation aimed at preventing terror. We have encouraged the, that the new administration understanding or understand the importance of strong Israel. There is, during his confirmation hearings last week, Secretary of State Powell stated that peace negotiations cannot be placed while violence and terror continue. He urged Arafat to do more to stop the violence. Secretary Powell stated that it all begins with making absolutely sure that Israel is secure and can defend itself. The United States and Israel enjoy a special relationship that extends across party lines in both countries. This unique partnership is based on common ideals and shared values, based on democracy and the desire for peace, based on devotion to our respective peoples and desire for their prosperity. We appreciated the friendship and the support of the United States as our greatest ally. Without it, we couldn't take those kind of risks which we are taking on the desire to achieve peace. As the only democracy in the Middle East, Israel is a crucial ally, helping to maintain stability in the region. Israel plays an important role as a counterbalance to Iran, Syria, and Iraq. Saddam Hussein has recently reared his head and is leading the anti-Western sentiment in the region. In recent weeks, Iraqi statements have become more extreme including threats to the United States, Kuwait, and Israel. Last week, Saddam Hussein threatened to bomb Israel for six months in order to bring about Palestinian independence. His son, Uday, was claiming that Kuwait should be back into the borders of Iraq. As you can well imagine, we have to take those kind of threats very seriously. Meanwhile, Iran and Syria continue to encourage Hezbollah attacks on the northern of Israel. This despite the fact that Israel withdrew from southern Lebanon in accordance to the Security Council Resolution 425, which we are obeying it to the point, and in spite of it, Lebanon government is not standing behind the commitment to deploy Lebanon army along the border. In October, three Israeli soldiers and an Israeli civilian were captured by Hezbollah. Since then, they have been all hostage, and the International Red Cross has been denied access to them. We demand that they be returned to Israel immediately. At the very far least, we insist on receiving information about their well-being. 
the Middle East is in, in a tough neighborhood. Sometimes we say that in the Middle East, the reality is much tougher than the imagination. One in which there is no pity for the weak. We would prefer to make peace with Canada or Mexico, but those are our neighbors and there we have to live. We know that the search for peace will continue to be painful and difficult. However, in the spirit of our national emblem, we still have no loss of our hope. We are strong people and we will overcome the difficulties on the road to peace and security. In perspective of 4,000 years, maybe it's going to be only small ups and downs and we are going to overcome it for a long future. Let me conclude on this note while the peace process has been a front page story since August. Please remember that Israel is more than just headlines, more than just politics. Our high-tech economy is booming. Immig immigration rate remain very high. Our scientists continue to make leaps forward in agriculture, biotechnology, and medicine. We are a thriving and vibrant nation, and we are only 52 years old with a wisdom of 4,000. Golda Meir once said, Zionism and pessimism are incompatible. Right now, the people of Israel are living proof of this statement. People live the daily lives, the highways are based of traffic, the cafes are fulfilled with crowds. We are a strong nation, and we are determined to build a better future for the children of the region and to make the dream of peace a reality. Thank you very much, and I'm ready for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. The floor is now open for questions. Yes, sir. Mr. Ambassador, you just said that you wanted to give uh, Gaza anyway, and I think that's the problem, that you want the Palestinians to accept what you want to give away anyway and be satisfied with that. Don't you think so? The observation is, and there is a question mark in there, Mr. Ambassador, the uh, observation is that Israel has a vision of peace which they expect the Palestinians to accept, and uh, they are. And the implication is that perhaps Israel is uh, not sensitive to what the Palestinians' vision of peace might be. I'm not calling the Palestinian enemy. I want to. I didn't call it, and I'm not calling them. I think they are neighbors. It's not very easy to live together, but they are neighbors. Secondly, I think there is a lot of fundamental basic differences between our two nations over there. But we have to live over there in the same place. There is other examples of other countries which used to be a nation which has to be the same conflict and the bitterness of the question that I'm referring to it. It's such that there is a lot of emotion being involved, emotional reaction. We have to look to the future. To, fi to try to find a way how to live together. We try to come up with our offers, with our thinking about what should be done, to sit down and to try to find a common language how to talk. When we came up in Camp David offering our concessions, we didn't, come, we didn't have any back, any kind of offer from Palestinian side. Even now when we are coming to Sharm el Sheikh, or we came or to came to Taba, they're asking what you are coming with new ideas from your side, but they are not coming with ideas of their side. That we have to come up and sit down, in my opinion, to try both sides to talk openly how much and how can we solve those issues. But beyond it, I would say that, you see, the Israeli society, in my opinion, went a long way toward peace. If you were asking people in Israel about 10 years ago about Palestinian state, one was supporting it, he was like a traitor. It's not anymore. Even the right-wing side in Israel is speaking about the right of Palestinians to have a state. 
Each one has his own opinion about the territorial borders, but everybody accepts that Palestinians should have a state. I can mention some other issues about the change of culture and mentality in the Israeli side toward peace. My opinion it hasn't happened too much in the Palestinian side. The incitement is continuing. The textbooks are staying the same, still provocating the existence of Israel as a country. This is a problem, in my opinion. How to educate both sides to try to come up to the option to live together, both sides had to compromise. Normally, I have a, a story about it, which is a very serious one, in spite of its, its a story. You see, in a, in, a, in a small community, they used to have the rabbi solving the small conflict between neighbors. Once a neighbor came over there, putting his case, and the rabbi said, listening to you, you're right. Second day, then other neighbor came over there putting his case, and the rabbi said, listening to you, you're also right. So out of the next door came his wife and said, Rabbi, how come that both of them are right? So the rabbi said, listening to you, my dear wife, you're also right. It's, it's a story, but it, behind it, it's a very good lesson, one of them. If everybody is right, there's no solution. And this is very important to understand. It cannot be that one side is always demanding 100%. You have to sit down to compromise. Secondly, it's better to make it between the neighbors. Not that I'm against rabbis, but rabbis shouldn't get in too involved in too much small conflicts. We should sit together to talk, to find a solution on how to live together. Rabbi has his own responsibility. And the third lesson, of course, is very important. Always listen to your wife, she's always right. Your uh, comment was a very good lead into my question and some recent intractable uh, problems around the world, South Africa and Northern Ireland. Uh, there have been religious leaders indigenous to those places that have provided uh, impetus um, one way or the other. In South Africa, Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu and um, the Reverend Ian Paisley in North uh, Northern Ireland, um, sort of opposites uh, in their approach. At least in my experience in, in casually observing what is happening in the Middle East, I'm not a student of the area, I haven't heard about any leadership coming from the religious community, and you just mentioned the roles of rabbis. Is there a rabbi or is there an imam who has a considerable amount of influence, or should there be? Is this, com is this purely a uh, secular problem that needs to be solved that way by politicians? I don't think it's a kind of a religious problem which we have. In spite of it, there is basically there is differences for religions, and, but this is not the major issue on the peace process. First of all, territories. Secondly, right of return. This is nothing which will depend on religious. And those are in some way the most, one of the most difficult issues on the peace process. I'm not trying to ignore the, the religious part of it, like in Ireland and other places. But I, I think in spite of it, if you are going to find a solution for the other issues, like Jerusalem, which is an emotional issue, it's not a religious one, or right of return, which is in some way a practical issue, which is a very, very serious one. The religious part of it, I hope you are going to find. I can say that for Israel, at least from Israel's point of view, and I'm supporting or defending our attitude, we are trying all the time to get out from the religious conflict. If you can see that every Friday, we are letting Muslims to come to pray to the Temple Mount or the Aqsa, what has been said, taking a lot of risks. Thousands, tens of thousands of people are coming over there to pray because we are saying that one of the principles which we have is to let everybody to have an access to his religious holy places. And we are sacrificing quite a lot of security because of it. So the idea of religious, in my opinion, at least from our principles, is going to be such that we are going to let everybody to have his own access. But my opinion, first of all, there is some basic issues like right of return with territories and how to find a solution for Jerusalem, which everybody has emotional attitude to. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, Arafat in before Arab audiences uh, over the years has proclaimed that 
Palestinians are in a jihad against Israel, a holy war, and um, uh, that, that, that his objective is a really t to take over all of Israel, and um, that negotiations are a stage in that process. If, uh, how, and in light of what is going on, uh, the violence and so on, it appears that he's carrying out that type of policy. Um, my question is, how, how do you negotiate with somebody who wants to see the destruction of Israel? We have to look for the future. Again, it's not very easy what I'm saying, because it's normally once you're losing confidence in your partner, you say, why should I make a negotiation with him? It's a good question. But we have to live in the Middle East, both nations, both countries, both people. This is the only way to, to live over there, by peace, not by sword or wars all the time. We have to look for three, four generations from now, and not by expecting that by signing a paper, a peace paper today, we are going to solve the issue. We should understand that even signing a good paper agreement now, never mind with whom it's going to be, I hope it's going to be with Arafat as a leader, it's not going to be in a comprehensive peace which we are going to achieve. Because still there is a lot of hatred and mistrust. There is a lot of time which we need to educate generation to come to understand that we can live together. That's why I'm saying that incitement is so important issue which we have to solve. Once we are going to make any agreement with anybody today, we are going to make an open door to come up to change those kind of culture, mentality, education, toward peace, toward living together for both benefit. So never mind if we don't like to have peace negotiation while there is violence, and it's a good idea how to respond, not to do it. But once there were some intention by uh, Chairman Arafat to reduce violence, which happened the last two, three weeks, we thought that maybe we should encourage the opportunity to make peace. But we are trying all the time to look forward, to give a chance for any opportunity for peace. It's not very easy what I'm saying, but I think we should always emphasize that peace is a long-term goal and not to yield to any kind of violence because of it. Mr. Ambassador, should uh, hopefully an accommodation be reached between Israel and the Palestinians and an independent Palestinian state is created, what's the economic basis for their survival? Do they have the technology, the industry, or the other Arab countries support them financially until they could be self-supporting, or would they have to continue to depend on employment and close cooperation with Israel? Well, first it needs need some time to build up economy, industry, and so on. In the meantime, we are ready to assist, and we did in some way a lot of effort to build up industrial parks and mention it. Unluckily, they've been, some of them have been damaged during the violence. We thought in some way that uh, by encouraging or enhancing the economy, it's going to be replacement for the desire for violence. I think in some way we lost some, we had some illusion about it because even the Palestinians got some better economy lately. They started last year about uh, a national economic growth which went not bad at all. In spite of it, violence started. They haven't been yet in a good economy situation. I'm not trying to underestimate what happened over there. But at least the opportunities started to come on. There were a lot of assistance coming from European countries and the United States, investment in harbors and airports and so on. So, but in spite of it, those are fundamental issues which are differences between our two people are not yet been closed up and in spite the economic started to grow up, now it's been, there is a setback on it. But uh, what I think that once it's going to be a peace, or once the visit, Palestinian state, we are going to offer as much as we can from our point of view, jobs and employment. That's why we are hesitating very much to get foreign 
uh, uh, people, workers coming from other countries, they want to come over there, from Turkey, from other places. We are reserving those kind of jobs for Palestinians. Once they are going to have their own economy, we are not going to force them not to have it. We are going to encourage to build up industrial parks, mainly on the, on the borders or the areas which have been going to be almost common. We are going to encourage any other country to invest over there. Maybe there is some reluctant to have our investment, which I understand from an emotional point of view. I don't understand from a logic point of view. But we are going to encourage any investment and any loans given over there to try to build up. But I must say that there were some disappointment in this case as well, because there were some not easy bureaucracy which were running the Palestinian Authority. There were some claims about corruption and so on, which I hope is going to be correct in the future. It's been written in some of the press in this country that the real lesson of what's happened in the last two years in our peace negotiation effort uh, is that it is now clear that most of the Palestinian people uh, have no intention of settling this peaceably, that they do not accept the existence of the State of Israel uh, as a Jewish homeland. Their version of peace is to uh, go into a world of Jews and Arabs living on a piece of land that is now Israel and calling it Palestine. Um, if that, in fact, is the case, there really is no chance for peace. The best that's going to happen in the Middle East is a state of peace and war living at the same time. My question is, is two-part. Do you agree with the comments about the true state of mind of the Palestinian people. And if, in fact, that is the case, how can the morale of the people of Israel be kept in a positive state decade after decade in a world where they live in terror? I still believe that there is a lot of people within the Palestinian people which are believe that Israel should exist, and I think it's been signed on the Oslo Agreement. This was part of the achievement or what Palestinians gave from their perspective. I'm not arguing about emotional issue because I was mentioning that incitement and education are part of the issue which I think we should achieve during the peace process. But normally what I'm saying, we prefer to make peace with Canada. But this is here. We have to live over there. Never mind what you think now some of the people of Palestinians are ignoring the existence of Israel. We have to change it. We have to work on it with their leaders, with their education. It's not very easy what I'm saying, but I think this is alternative. It's not right to educate children in Israel that there is no hope for peace, and that even generation from now, they have to educate the children always to be living on sword. This is not the idea, my opinion. We have to live in, in Israel, in Zion, what we used to say, as a country which are delivering know-how to other countries, not like a country which is delivering know-how of wars. In spite, we've been not bad in achievement of wars. But I think this is not the idea. The idea how to make a good country which can make good living out of culture, out economy, technology. And I can say that I was coming here to Washington with my wife, and the first thing which we heard on the radio was, the article was that the Sherry Blossom started today. We thought when we are going to come to the situation that in Israel, the first thing is going to be in the radio is going to be Shkediyah Blossom, I don't know if you know the Alma. This is the time which you're looking for, not an education for war. So we have to work very hard that maybe next or third generation can live in a time which they can speak about Sherry Blossom. I have three very brief questions. The first is, given observations of leadership or indicators of leadership, do you really believe that Arafat could have implemented a peace agreement if he had been taken the opportunity and negotiated one successfully? Second question, 
What will happen to the peace process if Ariel Sharon becomes Israel's next prime minister? It is, was said, it has been said that President Nixon, only Nixon could go to China. Is there an analogy there? I'm assuming the answer is no, but I'd like to hear your comments on that. The third question is, what can the United States do to continue to support the peace process, no matter what outcome of the elections? Well, I need about three hours to respond. I'll try to make it short, but uh, they are really the essence of the question which you were asking. First, I don't know what to say about how our father is going to stand behind commitment. Unluckily, we don't have too much good experience about it, but my opinion, in spite of it, this is our neighbors, and we have to make peace over there and to dictate that those our terms are going to be such that can be checked and checked, and we have to be strong enough that it's going to be implemented to the end of it. Not very easy. Again, easier to make peace with Canada. But this is the neighborhood which we have. So in spite of good questions, this is a reality which we have to face. But the second question is very dif difficult for me as a diplomat to answer. I'll try to make it such. My opinion, any society, all the people of Israel are urging for peace. Any leader is going to make peace. There is different styles, there are different ways of doing it, but the long term is going to be peace. People were criticizing Sharon for some time, but I can say that he was the one who made the negotiation with the Palestinian on Y plantation. Before coming to Y plantation, he said that he's not going to give up more than 9%, if you can recall the time. And he said that every percent is like the area of Tel Aviv. Sitting down over there, he was negotiating with the Palestinian and came up with 13% giving up in the white plantation. I hope and he understand he's practical and a real man and is going to make the best what can be done out of it for peace. I think this is the, the, the people of Israel which are urging for. What about the United States? Again, the best idea is to facilitate, facilitate the opportunity for those two partners to sit together and to negotiate, to find out the way they can live together. Uh, I mentioned the story about the rabbi. If the rabbi can ask the two people to go into the other room to solve the issue, it's going to be better, in my opinion, they're going to go out with a solution. They're going to live with it because they are going to decide about. If somebody else is going to decide for them, nobody is going to be satisfied with what solution has been achieved because each side is going to blame somebody for not achieving the optimum. It's not very easy again, but this is the way it should be done, in my opinion. Those two partners have to sit down to get out with a solution. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for being here tonight. I really especially enjoyed the part about husbands need to listen to their wives because they're always right. <laughs> you, you see, when my wife is not with me, I can dare to do it. Ah, good. <laughs> Thank you also for all the effort that you've obviously made toward peace. I have a question, though. Uh, as an American, I have learned about democracy. And my question is, how is it allowed, how have settlements and home de demolitions been allowed, even as late as yesterday, when the United Nations has condemned them, the rest of the world has condemned them, and yet they continue? I don't understand how this can happen in a democracy. There is no, not standing without any law by doing the settlements, actually. They are not taking any land from the arms. It's a national land which has been taken. And uh, everything was according to the law as much as I know. And part of the democratic system is to obey law. 
speaking about UN, in some way this is the place which I wouldn't dare to say that we are getting equal rights over the, not Israel. We are condemned anyway, never mind what we are doing. And uh, it's not very easy to, to say what I'm saying, but you see, even the violence started not because of Israel. We've been condemned in the UN. Even the last three months. We are a nation which are part of the UN for about 52 years. We are still the only country which will not have been accepted to working groups in the UN. And this is because of some of the majority of the countries which are democratic, not too much, but they were voting against Israel being participating in any working group in the UN. The only country which is out of it. So I wouldn't dare to say that we are getting an equal rights or standing behind. In spite of it, we try to obey those resolutions in the UN which we think are right from the democratic point of view. We have been with from Lebanon, obeying to the last inch of what they call the blue line which UN decided upon. We are the only one who is keeping it. The Lebanon are not keeping it. Hezbollah is not keeping it. But we try to obey to the last inch to it. In spite of it, it hasn't been very easy from our point of view. So I wouldn't dare to say that what's been decided in the UN toward Israel is the really right decision which I feel that we got an equal rights over them. My question is, as, as a Lebanese American, you touched on this somewhat already, but I have family there and I've been there. And I think a lot of Lebanese are, are tired of all these little groups uh, fighting on, on what is Lebanon. And my question is, uh, for Sharon, if he's elected, what might that mean for Lebanon, since he was, as they call him, the architect of, of the invasion, whatever that means? And um, that's my first question. What, what might that mean for Lebanon and for the citizens of Lebanon, not the groups who are fighting on it, who are living, who are fighting on its territory, excuse me. The other question is, um, I think that the Middle East issue is, is a great example of the intersection of politics, foreign affairs, and religion. And I don't think that you can ignore uh, religion in the issue. And to make this a question, uh, as, because people talk about a Jewish homeland and they talk about a jihad or holy war, so the issues are there. So are we uh, missing out on something uh, if we leave out the religion issue? I don't know who is going to win in the election. But is going to be a legitimate Prime Minister of the country of Israel, which has been elected by a democratic system. Some of the people in the region don't understand what does it mean election, democratic election. But this means that people are decided that he is going to be the Prime Minister. And it's the output of what situation in the region means. In some way, maybe because of the violence which Arafat, this is actually the cause why we have election. But First of all, we have to give a chance and we have to see what are the policy and what the way is going to run any prime minister is going to sit on each chair. We don't have the right to criticize before he's going to get and to put his way of policy. I mentioned before that he did some acts which people don't always try to remember about fried plantation, but beyond it. Is going to be the prime minister, is going to take all the responsibility on the authority, which is very different once you are part of opposition on any other part. We have not the right to criticize before he's getting his position. Secondly, about uh, the religious part of it. I'm not trying to ignore that this is a difference between religious as well. My opinion, it's the less problematic issue. It's still a problematic issue. In Ireland, it's still a major issue. I'm not trying to say it's not. But first, if you are going to find the solutions for the other issues, maybe the religious part is going to be easier to be solved, not easier. It's not going to be solved for future, for eternity. Those issues can be solved as a solution. Territorial one, if you are deciding once and there is a commitment both sides, this is the territory which is going to be 
the one which has been decided upon. Religious differences are going to continue, maybe. We have to find a way how to live the religious together, and I think this is an option which people can do. Think about the Jewish state, yes. We are emphasizing it's a Jewish state, because these are the only Jewish states which we have, and that's why we don't want to have the right of return, because right of return means that it's not going to be any more Jewish state. The other side, if they are claiming about jihad and having the Palestinian state of right of return, we are not trying to, to do anything against having right of return to the Palestinian side. So I'm not trying to ignore the religious part. What I'm, I'm trying to say that there are issues to be solved on the practical level. If they are going to be solved, it's going to left only the religious side, which can be, in my opinion, be solved by itself. In respects to the peace accords that were started with Egypt in 1980, the Camp David Accords, um, you, a few, uh, you mentioned Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. And there has been many, many times people have drawn analogies between Iraq's invasion of Kuwait and Hitler's in aggressions towards Czechoslovakia. And I was wondering with Israel trying to appease uh, Egypt and then trying to further now appease the other Arab nations, including Arafat. At one point, do you think that Israel has to uh, reaches the point that they say that they cannot appease anymore and that they recognize, or at least they come to the conclusion themselves, whether or not they're correct or not, I'm not going to say, that they come to the conclusion that Arafat cannot be appeased and that the, he does not want to be appeased and all he wants to do is destroy Israel? I don't think there is any point which we can say that there is no option for peace. There is no line like this, there is no point like this. My opinion, in spite of the other side, maybe we don't want to make peace, we are going to make peace hard way, but the, the easiest way. There is no way because I think people should live in peace. This is the goal. Mr. Ambassador, I'm going to thank you again for being here this evening. I uh, greatly admire your courage from your background of service to Israel. But my question is one of those without a question mark. I just want to get your point of view in regards to this. Given the difficult mosaic of the religious, cultural, and background differences of the Israelis and the Palestinians, wouldn't you think that the one common ground that can bring these people together the Israelis are not going away anywhere. This is their homeland. They cannot buy peace through appeasement. I'm convinced of that. The Palestinians are there, and they're not going anywhere either. The point is, and I'll use an analogy, then I'll get directly to my point. The implosion of the Soviet Union. They found they could no longer usurp the economies of Eastern Europe to sustain their military and their industrial base for war, even though I don't believe fully they've disarmed, but the point remains, they did implode. We did not have to fire a shot. Wouldn't the same thing be true in the hopes of a long-term solution in the Middle East of bringing economics to bear, which means simply give the Palestinians a reason not to make war, something genuinely that they have to lose, and that is the Israelis offering their superior technical and business prowess, sharing it with them to some degree, integrating them into the infrastructure of their economy, more so than what they have today, and offering this as a lead into a short and long-term solution rather than giving a land way I'm talking about trying to compromise by giving their security away, which will never work, it will never be agreeable, which will only lead to more war. So the point is, I'm saying, make economics, which is the basis upon which all humanity cooperates with one another. Integrate the Palestinians as much as possible in the hopes that the common person will in fact look towards greater leadership and better leadership honest brokering of, in fact, their interests as well as the Israelis. And if, in fact, this can be done on a short and long-term basis, I believe that the people in the area will have too much to lose in order to further their interests strictly 
on the basis of warfare alone. I'd like to get your point of view in that regard. Six million and one prime ministers, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, <laughs> like I said before, that's a question without a question mark. Somebody was listening very carefully to what I said, I see. Yeah, well. First, you see, you cannot dictate to the other partner what you think is logic from your side. There are a lot of emotion involved over there, and that once we are starting to build up industrial parks, some have been suspicious that we are taking all kinds of environmental issues to their side. Again, this one of the factors has been disrupted immediately, beginning with the violence, was one which has been blamed to be environmental issue. We went over there putting industrial facility over there to give them jobs. We tried to build up some industrial parks on the passages between Ascani and Erz. I don't know if some of you know, there is some more than 10,000 jobs over there. Part of them have been damaged now. Logic is not always working in the Middle East. Sometimes emotions are stronger than logic. Sure. And that's why you cannot dictate to the other side. That's why we have to listen to the other side and they have to listen to us. My opinion, we are not listening enough. It's a long-term issue to listen to each other. It's not just listening on the conversation and say, I listen to you and I have my idea. It's all right. I have my idea, but I'm not listening to you, actually. And this idea here over there, my opinion, we have to go a long way still. That's why we need to come up to kind of agreement such that it's going to make the open door for understanding each other, which is, it will take a long way. Part of the question is because we don't understand yet each other. Not that I have an illusion that it's going to be solved very easily. But first of all, we have to listen to each other to try to solve a point which can be solved and to go to another challenge to solve it, another one which can be solved, and not just demanding from the other side to solve the issue from my perspective. He should respond, and we don't understand what he was responding. He's not mature to come to it. That's what in some way happened on the process. So it's very complicated. A complicated issue not always been solved by logic, simple logic. The, your, your idea is right. It's good that they're going to have a reason not to lose something once they're going to have a good economy. I agree. But how to come to this situation? It's a long way. We cannot dictate to the other side how they want to come to do it. It takes strong and honest leadership. There's no question. Yeah. Thank well, you, Ambassador. Thank you. Last comments from my side. <laughs>